Hello and welcome to the session on moving to 3D slope stability analysis. Questions answered. My name is Murray Fredland and I'm happy to be guiding you through some popular questions that have been asked of me over the years in firms trying to move to a three-dimensional analysis. So before we get there, a little bit of background. The industry has largely embraced a two-dimensional limit equilibrium method with respect to slope stability analysis as an accepted method of practice. I mean, we've gotten to accepting factors of safety between 1.3 and 1.5. What is the interest here? So consulting firms have an interest in 3D analysis. What value does it provide? Let's look at that. Is it reliable? How do I fit it in the context of my existing historical understanding of two-dimensional analysis? So some of the questions that we have to consider when moving our firm to a three-dimensional analysis are as follows. Is 2D or 3D a more reliable analysis? What can cause differences between 2D and a 3D analysis? I have concerns about the side force assumptions in LEM analysis. How does that play into this? Is there a difference between analysis methods? Uh, is there a difference between software packages? And um, we can go on to further questions, but in the first session here, we're just going to pick off the first five questions and we're going to answer them. So firstly, is 2D or 3D a more reliable analysis? Numerical models are simulations of reality. We attempt to build models and represent geometries, boundary conditions, material properties, and the governing physics to the best of our knowledge. As we represent each of these more accurately, our model will more closely emulate reality. 3D models represent geometry and the slip surface more accurately. Principle number one is that as we more closely emulate reality, our models will improve. Question number two, what can cause a difference between a 2D and a 3D analysis? Well, to understand that, what we have to understand is what we are actually doing. In a historical two-dimensional model, we uh, work with a profile and we draw a, maybe have a slip surface or an anchor implemented in this slope and we want to know the stability of it. Uh, what we're actually formulating in the software is that 2D model extruded out infinitely in the third dimension. Uh, our slip surface really becomes a barrel in three dimensions that is rotating and the sides of the barrel have no frictional resistance to movement. So that is why a two-dimensional factor of safety is somewhat conservative, is it does not account for the frictional resistance of the sides of the barrel. Likewise, our anchor in three dimensions is actually a steel plate. And we scale it back to try to approximate the, the load taken by an anchor. However, it must be realized that in reality, anchors are point loads, and we are approximating them with a plate load that is scaled back in strength. So if we look at continuity between 2D and 3D LEM, the idea is that we want to set up a three-dimensional model that exactly replicates a two-dimensional model that we've set up. And in this figure, we have a two-dimensional model, in this slide rather, and we have set it up, analyzed a particular slip surface, and then in the right-hand figure, what we've done is extruded that same slip surface out in 3D, and then we don't apply any shear resistance to the ends of that slip surface. And what that is, is a completely equivalent analysis in 3D. And the factor of safety as a proof will be exactly the same as 2D. The interesting thing is that, um, uh, that most real slips do not look like this. And yet we model this routinely with 2D. So 2D, you can see, is a little bit of an approximation of reality. So uh, we should talk through a little bit of the plane strain condition because it is noted in the past that the 3D slip surface is really made up of a main part as can see, you can see in the figure on the left, and then you have ends that, that uh, join with the surface. And the concept is, is as L increases, as your slip gets wider and wider and wider, the effects, the relative influence of the ends becomes less and less. And the idea is that eventually in 3D, as your slip gets wider and wider, it will approach the 2D slip surface, or the 2D factor of safety which is true theoretically and has been proven uh, by Jens and uh, various other researchers over the years. However, what that, in, what that also assumes is that that slip shape extends perfectly in the third dimension 
and that that slip shape is maintained. And really what we've seen in the field is that small variations in the topology or the geostrata or the water table will cause your slip surface to reduce to a ellipsoid type of shape in soft soils quite immediately. If you assume an ellipsoidal slip shape, what you'll see is that your 3D to 2D ratio of your factor safety will actually bottom out at an incremental value of about 8 to 15 percent higher than your two-dimensional factor of safety. And this can be shown through simple analysis. So even though theoretically you can get a three-dimensional slip surface, if you extend it long enough in the third dimension to collapse down to a 2D, in the real world that is not practical. So let's just look at an example problem. Here we have an analysis uh, benchmark that was originally published in 1977. You get a factor safety of 1.22 through the Morgenstern price method and you have a water table, you have a circular shape that is truncated by a weak layer and bedrock at the bottom. And if you extend that shape out in three dimensions, the aspect ratio stabilizes at about 5.0. This is assuming an ellipsoidal slip shape. So you can therefore determine the difference between a 2D and a 3D factor of safety quite easily by just extruding a model and running an ellipsoidal shape slip surface. So what can give a difference between your 2D and your 3D factor of safety? Well, there are really six different aspects and those include your slip surface shape, your topology, your geostrata, your water table might be different in 3D, you might have distributed or point loads in your model, and you might have anchors, micropiles, or geomembranes that can give a difference between your 2D and your 3D factor of safety. Geometry effects of your topology can be quite easily demonstrated to give a difference in your factor of safety. And here we have research published from Jitterana in 2019 that showed uh, for vertical cuts at different angles, convex and concave, between 90 and up to 270 degrees, you can plot the difference between 2D and 3D factors of safety. And you see the differences range between 36% and up to 72% in this case, just from a difference in your surface geometry. So that can be quite easily demonstrated with a 2D and a 3D analysis. So another question is, I have concerns about the side force assumptions in the limit equilibrium method. So let's go through and unpack that a little bit. So in this slide, this demonstrates the historical definition of our side force functions, both in terms of your normal stress and your shear stress. And here we're going to represent our normal force as an E value and X as our shear force. And it can be seen that they're increasing with depth and they can be applied against our side of our each slice in the analysis. So if we look through every different method of limit equilibrium analysis, we'll see that the primary difference is what assumption they've made as far as their normal and shear force as between slices. So for example, in the ordinary method, we satisfy moment equilibrium and force perpendicular and set E and X equal to zero. Uh, bishops, we solve for vertical equilibrium and moment equilibrium and we assume that E is horizontal and X, your shear force, is zero. And then we all come down to Spencer's method, which solves for vertical, horizontal, sum of forces, and moment equilibrium. And it says that the resultant of E and X are of constant slope. So we have different side force functions that have resulted in different methods of analysis in the limit equilibrium method. So in Fellinius method, for example, the inter-slice uh, normal forces, E, and inter-slice shear forces are all set to zero. So your free body diagram looks quite simplified, and really your weight of every slice is translated into a normal force and a shear force at the base of the slice. In Janbu and Bishop methods, we have a single normal force between our slices and no shear force uh, acting on. All the shear forces are set to zero. And then lastly we have Morgenstern Price, Corps of Engineers, and Lowe and Karafiath method. And you can see for example in Morgenstern Price and GLE method that it solves for vertical, horizontal, and moment equilibrium. 
and the direction of e and x is defined as an arbitrary function. The percent of the function used is uh, required to satisfy moment and force equilibrium is called your lambda function and that has to be found through iteration in the solution. So if we look at the definition between your shear and your normal forces for the Morgenstern price and GLE method, you can see that your shear force is a function of your normal force times lambda and times uh, f sub x or fx which is a mathematical function that defines the slope of the ratio of x divided by e. So that force, that function, uh, can be defined several different ways. It can be a constant, which is what Spencer has assumed in his methodology. You can use a half sign, a trapezoidal shape, or a user-defined shape. And all of these are selections in the software. And the idea is to, to have this function represent shear forces that are represented of, representative of reality in numerical modeling. So do they represent reality or what's the actual function like in, the so in, in reality? Well, research done by Wilson uh, back a number of, number of years and published in 1983, what Wilson did is ran a finite element stress analysis, turned on gravity, and then found what the ratio of x divided by e was as a function of uh, the, di the distance across the slope. And he developed a bell-shaped type of function that was quite consistent between different, uh, different analyses. And he developed, therefore, a function that is closely related to a, a finite element, what a finite element stress analysis would give you in this case. So it's closest to reality. And what it resulted in was uh, st more stability in the numerical analysis, and the analysis would converge more easily. And so therefore, what we have in solving this, as you can see with different lambda values, there is difference between your f for factor safety due to moment and due to forces. And sometimes these can give quite different results. And what you want to do is iterate and adjust lambda such that they converge so that you're solving effectively for both force and moment equilibrium methods in the software, which uh, Morgan Stern Price, GLE, and Spencer are your primary methods that give you this. And those are the methods that we should be using in practice. So we can look at the difference between force and moment equilibrium for different shapes of your slip surface. Uh, if we look at lambda for uh, more of a wedge type of failure, we can see that our force equilibrium is almost horizontal and the factor of safety is, common, is, is constant no matter what type of what value of lambda you pick. However, your moment equilibrium varies quite significantly. So we pick the point we want to iterate and pick the point in the software where we satisfy both force and moment equilibrium. Uh, likewise, another example of a composite type of failure, you can see that both the force and moment equilibrium diagrams are both varying as a function of lambda. So again, we want to pick the lambda value where both of these converge to a singular value so that we know that we're solving both force and moment um, in, in satisfying these in the equations. And this was published many years ago. So really what we can see is that we have developed assumptions for side force functions with these various approximations, but we have proven uh, based on analysis done by Wilson that our assumptions match the, the st same stress distributions given by finite element stress analysis quite consistently and result in uh, a very reasonable assumption as far as our interslice force functions. So moving on to another question, is there a difference between analysis methods? So determining if there's a difference between analysis methods, we can quite easily determine if there is one through experiments. So we can take a single problem here, a single model, and look at a particular example. Uh, in this case, there were about 30 designated pour water pressure measurements. Um, we analyze this model using different methods, and we get different results. We can see here there is, outside of the ordinary method, there is very little difference between the factors of safety determined for the other methods. 
less than a 10% difference. So this example was developed based on a real world scenario from 1974 in France, which was built and a failure induced for testing and research purposes. So if we take this same methodology and we run it out to many different models uh, and look at the differences between the analysis methods, what we see is we can plot the differences and show them for different searching methods and look at hundreds of models. And if we, it's quite interesting because if we look at that and the figures here show the differences utilizing a block search and fully specified and grid and tangent searches. And you can see the differences um, are more pronounced in the less known methods, such as in less utilized methods, which use either force or only moment analysis methodologies. If for the methods that use both force and moment together, then their results are remarkably consistent. So the GLE, Spencer, and Morgenstern price method difference uh, ranges between 3 and 10 percent in terms of analysis differences in generating your factor of safety. So is there a difference between software packages? Another great question here. Okay, we can explore this and this is a valid question to see if you should get different answers between different software packages. So because implementing each analysis method depends on a host of things. You can have a different development platform, a different development uh, language or software code and the qualifications of the programmer in developing the methodology. And we need to know if an engineer models the same problem in two different packages, what is a reasonable difference? And so we have compared the software to other packages on the market, such as uh, Slide, Slope WX, Stable, and Utexes were utilized in comparing the limit equilibrium method in different software packages. And what we found really is that there is very little difference between different software packages in terms of the analysis method. And this is making sure that you are using exactly the same model setup, the same analysis method, and the same searching method for your critical slip surface. We found that reasonable deviations are plus or minus 3%. And reasonably, if, if you have a well-defined problem, uh, you could probably bring that down reasonably to about 1.5%. Greater than that, you should, um, you probably should investigate on whether or not you have a difference in how your model is set up in a different software program. And it's uh, likely either due to a difference in the setup or there's uh, a possible issue in one of the programs that you've utilized in the analysis. So the conclusions that we can gain so far in this are that 2D plane strain analysis is inconsistent with the geometry of typical failures you should be using three-dimensional analysis these days because it's very easy to set up. A 3D LEM analysis is, is an extension of 2D LEM theories. And moving to an ellipsoidal slip shape on an extruded model makes an 8 to 15% difference in the factor of safety. And there are six primary influences of the factor of safety in 3D that can make a difference between 2D and a 3D calculated factor of safety. Uh, we know that 3D analysis increases analysis accuracy, and we know that it's possible to represent interslice forces well with Wilson's method that has been proven to be consistent with the type of stresses produced in a finite element analysis. Um, we recommend the analysis methods of GLE, Morgenstern Price, and Spencer as they solve both force and moment equilibrium, and we should be doing that these days because it's, it's um, no more costly in terms of computational time. Typical variation between the, the main methods of analysis should not be more than 3 to 10 percent and the maximum variation between software packages solving the same exact same two-dimensional limit equilibrium analysis should be plus or minus 3 percent and no more. So these are the things that we know so far and that we can move forward on giving us answers in our analysis and moving to 3D.